welcome back to another episode of Buffalo Happy Hour. Mike, we got a good one today. Oh, Derek, we got a lot going on uh, before we hit record, but we're good. <laughs> um, technical difficulties never cease to amaze us, even after damn near three and a half years, but right. we're doing a good time. So uh, we have a wonderful guest and a tremendous opportunity to pick his brain and talk to him and, and dive into all things uh, spirit related. So we'll start with introductions so our audience knows what's going on and what brought us all together today. So do you mind introducing yourself and the wonderful brand that you do work for? Yes, my name is Mike Cameron and I'm uh, one of the founders of Devil's River Whiskey. Uh, we're based in San Antonio, Texas, 100%. Um, and uh, this company has was formed in 2015, and uh, this is the second distillery that I've done in, in specifically San Antonio. Oh, but really? happy to be here. What was the first one? I uh, co-founded Rebecca Creek. Oh, okay. Is nice. that still around? It is, yeah. Uh, I believe that brand is in 11 states, and um, we started with a vodka, and then later uh, got into whiskey. We were one of the first American single malts with that company, and... Uh, and uh, but yes, it's still in existence. I still have my ownership stake in it, but uh, no longer involved in any of the day-to-day. -day. This is 100% my focus now. So what made you transition to Devil's River then? I just have a passion like you guys for, <laughs> for brown water, specifically bourbon. Um, we didn't have a bourbon at the time. We, we had a spirit whiskey, which as you guys know is a blend. And then we had our single malt, which I like single malts, mm -hmm. but um, I just have always, I mean, since forever our family big bourbon drinkers my mother's from louisville my grandfather's from louisville and um just have a lot of interest in in the history of bourbon specifically so um that's really the reason i and i just kind of wanted to get a fresh start and and uh that's where devil's river came from i love it and it's an honor to have you on the show mike and i have been talking about devil's river i think it's been three and a it was one of our first whiskeys that we've kind of reviewed over like three years ago. Yeah, I would say Devil's River really made Derek and I realize that there are really good options outside of Kentucky for less than $50 that you should really dive into and explore. And we've been preaching Devil's River since we found it, um, which is, yeah, three, three and a half years ago. And it's just been nonstop. So well, I really appreciate I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And what kind of interests us most about it is because everyone really hypes up Kentucky and all that. But when you compare the, just the geographical locations of Kentucky to Texas and the climate differences and all that, you get significantly different whiskey in Texas. Can you talk a little bit about that and how it's different in Texas when it comes to whiskey? Sure. And I get asked this question a lot. You know, what makes a Texas whiskey a Texas whiskey? Um, the, I have been the president of the Texas Distilled Spirits Association for the last eight years, I believe now, and so I've, it's really been nice to watch this industry, you know, blossom in Texas. Texas is now number one for vodka production in the U.S. with companies like Tito's and Deep Eddy and others. Hmm. And uh, a lot of people don't realize, but Texas kind of oscillates between number three and number four between, um, you know, Texas and Indiana, but we're a distant third and fourth behind Kentucky and Tennessee, hmm. but really moved uh, uh, in the last several years especially there's 210 craft distilleries in in Texas um, about 2700 nationwide so uh, it's just been neat to watch you know the first distillery I did here was like I think we were like number eight hmm. and uh, now there's 210 so it's, it's it's really grown a lot because of legislative changes and the interest in craft but specifically you know hearkening to your question the 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 Texas whiskey is just it's bolder in terms of not just the people <laughs> and the pr the pride but it's it is really a bolder flavor whiskey because it is so freaking hot I like to joke and say we have two seasons here hot and hotter <laughs> uh, we don't have any kind of change of seasons here I mean I'm just had to come inside because it's 110 right now outside it's ridiculous but so we have a I'd say a Blanton style Rick House it's a metal Rick House. And we have uh, our, our our cooperages in there. I mean, our, our Rick House, and, and it is, uh, you know, it's it's give and take. You know, so the 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 yields are not that great because our angel share is so high. Mm -hmm. If you walk into that room on a day like today, it'll I mean, it'll, it'll burn your eyes because sure. there's such a high concentration of angel share. Wow! But it does spend more time in the wood. 
um, you know, it's 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 the, not so much the heat as is the heat changes the barometric pressure, which pushes it into the staves where it spends more time in the wood. So you get a lot more of those bolder flavors. Um, but we lose quite a bit on our angel share. So we're we're fifteen percent losses in year one. So it's a lot. That's what I was going to ask if you were able to quantitate the amount of loss. So when you're looking at the aging process, are you trying to not you obviously take angel share into account, but what I'm looking for is um, your explanation on when you age it, say for, you know, four years is you're looking at the climate and you're looking at the temperature swings and you're like, okay, I can get a eight, nine year taste whiskey out of, you know, a four or five year age, just because of the amount of interaction that we're getting. Are you seeing that? And it does it kind of bother you two part question. Does it kind of bother you? Cause then you can't put a higher age statement <laughs> on the label because it'd be nice to put eight years on it, but you're like, I don't you have I, like I three can't. bottles to sell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great question. And, and it, it get asked a lot. And, and some of my other fellow Texas distilleries that do whiskey and age products, we all exper- experience the same thing, especially in central and South Texas, where it is so hot, but um, no, it's a, uh, I would, it's kind of a common belief here that let's just say a two year aged bourbon is equivalent to a four year in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, you can do side by side comparisons on, you know, those flavor notes and it's about right. So I, you know, that is one advantage of the heat is we can get to market faster. But like I say, we do have to get to the point to where we got to dump it or we'll just keep losing it. So, right. <laughs> um, I, I, as far as your question on the aging, you know, age is in a, a number, as they always say. And, you know, I, I think, if we can get liquid to lips, that's really the key. Mm-hmm. We do a ton of activation with tastings, and and, uh, and then the spirit speaks for itself. It, and, the, and people seem to really enjoy it overall. And um, so I think that's the key is to educate that consumer that it doesn't have to be a ten year old. But we're just getting ready to release our first five year product. Um, it'll be out this fall, and it is fantastic. There wasn't a lot of it, but, <laughs> but it was fan- <laughs> it's fantastic. So, um, so I'm real excited to release that, and it's expensive. I mean, it's it's seventy nine ninety nine for a retail. It's, it's a, a five year Rye River series. Um, we're partnering with uh, AmericanRivers.org, which is a national organization, and we're taking the percentage of the sale of each bottle and donating it to American Rivers to just go to river protection, the river cleanup. And I've been up in your neck of the woods up there. Niagara is a beautiful, beautiful place, and and. Uh, and, you know, I just love wild rivers. I've got one running through my backyard in my house in Colorado. And I, I just, when we started growing this brand, we were relevant in Texas. You know, we've got the Devil's River, which is a real place. And we were the largest corporate donor to the Devil's River. But as we expanded into other states, you know, people in other states would say, well, I've got wild rivers in my state. What about these wild rivers? So it kind of made me rethink how we can be more relative locally to every state. And so, finding this AmericanRivers.org. We're the official bourbon of their organization. And uh, they're DC-based, about 250 employees. They do great work. Wow. It's kind of an apolitical issue. I mean, who doesn't love a wild river? So, you, right. know, <laughs> you know, so it's been it's been neat to be involved. And we're just kind of launching that uh, with this new bottle. That's awesome. What What's unique about the Devil's River, though, is that it's that limestone, right? Can you talk a little bit about how you guys found out well, I guess it's probably easy to find out that it's limestone, but that it affects the water that much? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not so much that the Devil, the Devil's River is a magical place, but, you know, Kentucky or Tennessee or Pennsylvania where whiskey used to be made, you know, in that northeast corridor, it's not that they're – you just have to have good limestone filtered water wherever you make whiskey, and that's that's the good basis for it. It is a natural filter as it works through the strata of the limestone. It, it brings with it – um, you know, mineral content. Um, it brings with it almost a sweet profile. Uh, I discovered the Devil's River back in college many, many years ago. Now, 35 years ago, I was in college, but I went on a fishing trip down there with some buddies. Nobody knew about the Devil's River back then. It was it's still that way pretty much until we came along. Um, but it's it's cell phones don't work, which is wonderful. You go down there. Absolutely. They only allow 12 kayaks a day on the river, and you have to register with the state of Texas to float this place. Oh, wow. Um, the water that comes out of there is used by Texas Parks and Wildlife as the benchmark of purity for all the all the lakes, rivers, and streams across Texas. Mm-hmm. So it is 
just this amazing place. You're in the middle of a desert, and all of a sudden you come across this beautiful river that's all spring-fed, and um, it's dark. the headwaters start in a little small town called Juneau, Texas, which is 90 miles north of where I draw this water from. I formed a partnership with a ranch owner down there. I go onto his property. There's a well on his on his property, and I draw water out of that well, bring it up to San Antonio. So every every bottle of Devil's River has a little bit of the Devil's River water in it. We finish with that water. Is sure. what we do with it. Did you run into any issues from the state of Texas to draw water from there, since it's kind of such a protected river? Um, we didn't so much with the state of Texas. There were some people that were unhappy about it, um, but I, I always came from a place of conservation and not to be you know abusive of the of the privilege i met with the devil's river conservancy first and told them what i wanted to do they were skeptical and but they took an annual donation from me for three years it was kind of behind the scenes and we didn't really talk about it and then i finally said you know i think i've proven that we're being good stewards we've made annual donations to your organization we really like to go public with this and promote the devil's river and so they agreed, and we continue to support them, and they've been a great partner for us. And uh, this is on the southern end of the river where this ranch is, so we're not, like, draining the water where it comes in. We're, we're taking it after it's already run down its course into Lake Amistad. So we're just, just up from Lake Amistad where it would uh, drain down into that lake. So um, it's a great question. I get asked that periodically, and, and uh, but, you know, it's, it's uh, something that we tried to be respectful of, there was not a water district and there's still not a water district down there. If they did form a water district at some point, we would be grandfathered in because we were started this project before that. But nice. there's the, 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 to answer your question, the reason we were legally able to do it is because there's no water district in that area. Gotcha. I feel like it's an important <clears throat> detail that you spoke on when you said you finished with it. It's not like you're distilling a hundred percent of the process with all of the water from devil's river where you're just like, it's a direct tap in and it's going right into the distillation process. Like you're, it, you're using elements of it, which I mean, that's, that's genius, but I think it's a, a massive point to make yeah. because I don't think a lot of people really understand all of that. So thank you for saying that. Now question, <laughs> do you have any idea? The, the, the river is amazing. So why is it associated with the devil? Well, um, there's a famous Texas Ranger. Um, his name was John Coffee Hayes. Uh, he was quite a quite a legendary hero around around Central Texas and Texas in general. Um, he came from, I think, originally Tennessee. He's related to one of our U.S. presidents. And uh, anyway, he was a land surveyor. He surveyed one of the, the first map of Texas and several other cities. Uh, he was good with a gun, and and he helped settle the West and. After he left San Antonio and Central Texas, uh, he went on to San Francisco to become their first sheriff of San Francisco. Hmm. Um, but the story goes, Spanish explorers came to the Devil's River in 1590, and they originally called it uh, San Pedro, which is St. Peter in English, and uh, St. Peter's River. And um, several hundred years later, John Coffee Hayes is down there with some scouts, and they said, his name was Captain Jack Hayes, they said, Captain, Captain Hayes, this is... St. Peter, St. Peter's River, San Pedro River, and he said, St. Peter Hell, this is more like the Devil's River. The, and the reason he said that is because the area between San Antonio and the Devil's River is very remote. It's dry. It's got mesquite. It's got rattlesnakes. Back then, it probably had Comanches. It, it, it was just a rough, you know, patch of horseback riding down to there. So when he finally got to the river, he was probably thirsty, and it was August and hot, and, and so... Uh, that's where the story came from, and that was in 1840. So when you look at our label, when you see 1840 on the label, um, that's the year that John mm-hmm. Coffee Hayes named the Devil's River. That's and awesome. the side story. The side story on there is we got permission from the family to use his name and likeness, and so it's just kind of the backstory behind our brand and how it got named. How did you find that's his? So cool. fa- I'm. What did you do? Like tap into Ancestry.com, <laughs> and you're like, who's a living family member? <laughs> how did that work? Well, again, Texans are pretty proud, so if you're related to John Coffey Hayes, you're going to know about it. It's true. I also have one of his pistols in my collection, which are extremely valuable, an old um, uh, 1840 Colt, a beautiful, and it was a factory engraved Colt pistol that uh, that he sweet. used, and it's just amazing. So, um, you know, it just the family liked the story, and, and uh, 
I learned out later that I, I learned later that I didn't have to get permission, but I was glad that I did just out of respect for yeah. them. Um, but I guess there was a law passed, not to get too deep into legals, but there's a law called the Buddy Holly Law. And anybody bef- that was that was around before Buddy Holly, you can take their name and likeness and use it. Anybody after Buddy Holly, you have to get permission. So I learned that through the legal process. But, I mean, I think that speaks character to you and the brand is even going back to using water from the Devil's River. You just want to do things correctly and respectfully, which I think is even more admirable now hearing it directly from you. Like, that's awesome that you did that. Thank you. Yes, it's. Uh, I, I just love Wild Rivers. I love, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of them that were dammed up mm-hmm. over the years. And this American Rivers does great work. So they're... They take the money that they raise and they tear down old dams that are not relevant anymore and revitalize that, you know, that habitat. And they have groups that go out and clean up rivers. And and, uh, it's just, you know, monitor these wild, beautiful places that are part of our our nation. So it's it's, it's a neat organization to be associated with. For sure. So this five-year product that you're going to be, this five-year bourbon that you're going to be releasing soon. It's a rye. Or rye, I'm sorry. That's your ninth product, right? I think yes, sir. We have it is. we have six of them here because Mike and I have finished the other two, and they're no longer with us. <laughs> and two of them are also basically gone at this point. Um, your first product that you released was that the Red Label Straight Bourbon. It was yes, yeah. ninety proof. What? So you said that you came from that other distillery, didn't really have a bourbon product. Walk us through that first product of that Red Label and kind of how you how you created it but also the price point behind it because like mike was saying one of the things that turned us on to devil's river is just the affordability of it and how in new york at least you can't find any bourbon for less than 50 dollars, let alone something great like devil's river so can you give us an idea of the, the whole thought process behind that product sure you know it was it was always my intent to to build a, a company that would appeal to the masses you know the the everyday drinker, you know, you kind of have your special occasion bourbons that you might bring out occasionally, but we'd like to be your, your daily drinker if you drink bourbon every day or every week. And so that was one part of it. And then I looked at all the major brands out there. You know, the number one selling whiskey in Texas is is Crown Royal. And the 750,000 cases a year they're selling. And, wow. Um, Jack Daniels is number two at somewhere around 600,000 cases. And I looked at those price points and I thought, you know, could I get it kind of in the neighborhood of that to where if someone wants to give us a try, they won't have that objection of price. Mm-hmm. So I've tried to hold as true as I can to that. Uh, we have never taken a price increase through all these supply chain issues and pandemic and everything else, but we are going to be taking our first one. It's not a big one in January of next year. So, um, but that is, yeah, that is something that's coming, but we, we just couldn't hold off any longer. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But that, the red label, the rye, and then also what is the other product? The, the barrel strength? They're all the same in New York. Yeah. I don't know if that's true in Texas because New York has crazy different prices, but I believe those three products are the same price point at like thirty two ninety nine in New York. Yeah, that's um, cheaper on the barrel strength because okay. it's typically thirty four ninety nine. But Nobody it is not. It was. It Maybe, was because yeah. when we seen it, we're like, it's two extra dollars for a barrel strength. Right. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> like, yeah, just just go buy the barrel <laughs> yeah. strength. Yeah. We were laughing about it. <laughs> we do a lot of tastings at military bases. Um, we're big supporters of the U.S. military, and I'll be there on a Friday night doing a tasting, and these guys come in or girls come in. They always say, "Give me the barrel strength." Mm-hmm. <laughs> After, yeah. after a week of, of being in the military, they, they want the strongest thing we have. So, <laughs> and, and it's affordable. So, yeah. Um, but you're going to see most of our products. We try to keep them competitive. I mean, we could make more money. We can always raise our prices, but we just still want to. Our model is to appeal to the masses, and I think that's why we've grown so fast. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And to that point, the first flavor product that you released was a little bit ago, and that was their coffee bourbon. And that one I am so interested in because it is difficult to find a good flavored bourbon that comes out or a good flavored whiskey that comes out at 80 proof. A lot of the times you see flavored products come out 60, 65, 70 proof. What was the thought process behind that of coming just at 80 proof and not diluting it down? Well, first of all, and this is not a dig on a well-known cinnamon, quote unquote, whiskey, (laughs) But that is not whiskey. You know, whiskey has got to be 40% alcohol. That's the definition. So if I was going to call it coffee bourbon, it needs to be bourbon. 
you know, at, at, at the, you know, the base spirit. It's, so it's 90 down, proof down to 80. And um, everything I've done on the flavored profile, I wanted to also be all natural. So we partnered here with a local coffee company called San Antonio Coffee Roasters. We take three varieties of coffee beans um, from Colombia, Brazil, and um, uh, Nicaragua, I believe. Yes, Nicaragua. And, and it's a Vienna roast, so it's on the darker end of the roast, and uh, so it impacts a lot of flavor. It's got real caffeine in it from real coffee beans that have been roasted, and uh, it's got the caffeine level somewhere between an espresso and a cappuccino, so it's got a pretty good amount Ooh, of caffeine in it. I like that. And then, and then the sweetness that you're tasting in the coffee bourbon is from our 100% Blue Weber Agave that we have an arrangement with an estate farmer down in, in Jalisco where we import, you know, we're close to the border. So so coming through Laredo is not a big deal, and mm -hmm. we bring up the agave from there, and that's the sweetness. So, again, all natural ingredients. And the day that they roast the coffee beans, they bring them over to our facility, and we begin the, the steeping process. So it's it's right away. We want to capture all that. I love when we're making coffee those, those mornings because it, the whole place smells wonderful. <laughs> oh, I bet. Are you a coffee drinker and, like, outside of whiskey i'm i just love the smell of it i'm an i'm a tea drinker but i'm not a coffee drinker everyone in my family drinks coffee but i just never have cared for care for it but i know a lot of people like it it's the you know water is the most consumed beverage in the world and then tea and there's coffee so it's popular mm -hmm. it's just not my favorite but it doesn't matter what i like it matters what the public likes and there's a lot of coffee drinkers out there so the the interesting thing about that, it, it, we won't talk about other brands, obviously, but you have brands that don't use natural flavors and they use syrups, and you can really tell when a brand uses, like, let's say, a peanut butter syrup, a, opposed to using natural coffee flavors. And I think that when when people rec or ask for my recommendation on things, and I say Devil's River, I think they're starting to get a little bit annoyed because they think that somehow you guys are paying us, which you're not. But like the, they're like, why do you keep talking about them? Be and it's just because your products are so solid all around. Like this coffee bourbon, I don't like flavored whiskeys, but I can destroy this all the time because it's just so delicious. You also are obsessed with coffee. I mean, that's a fair point, but still, <laughs> it, it's so good and so well made. And I think that you have now that I know if there's caffeine in it, maybe I'll drink it in the morning. But there's just so many different aspects of other flavored products that are very unappealing to people. And I think you hit it on the head with this one. It's just perfect. Thank you very much. You know, the, there's a lot of things, as you mentioned too earlier, liqueurs. I mean, mm -hmm. this is not a liqueur. It's a flavored whiskey. Right. Uh, the, flavor, the flavored whiskey category has certainly grown a lot. It's 25% now of all whiskeys sold. Um, and we got in on that pretty early with the with coffee bourbon it, it's i think it was like 15 percent. now mm -hmm. it's 25 so it's still a growing category um i think that all started with vodka and then tequila and now there's flavored whiskeys but i i just i think people can uh, to your point people can taste natural and they can taste artificial and not to dig on anybody else but it's just it was important to me that we have all natural yeah it, absolutely so that being said i I, this would be a good segue to talk about your newer products. I want to get to like the, the more um, specialty stuff around the, your distiller select and your single barrel stuff. But since we're on the topic of flavored whiskeys, you guys recently came out with an agave bourbon and a cinnamon bourbon. The cinnamon, obviously, it's a good competitor to other things because it's natural flavors. It, it tastes n less syrupy, which, again, is the appeal of your products. But... Talk to us a little bit first about the agave and what that whole relationship was, because I believe that blue agave you said you already used before, and it's coming right from Jalisco, I believe, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I had no idea how agave bourbon would 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 work. I, I really didn't. All I knew is that tequila was the number one selling spirit last year, and, and whiskey was right behind it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this concept of maybe bringing them together in a in a way that wouldn't be gross <laughs> to where it, it tastes good and, and and has a lot of flavor but but also pleasant on the palate this has blown me away how popular this product is i mean it's still growing by leaps and bounds every month we're getting larger and larger po's and it and most of the business is just in texas so far so once the rest of the u.s learns about agave bourbon you know california number one tequila consumption mm -hmm. state in the u.s once Illinois and New York and other states, Florida, pick up on it, I think it's going to continue to go up in popularity. It's opened up a whole new customer category, too, especially with young people and female consumers who 
necessarily don't always drink hardcore bourbon or hardcore bourbon drinkers it's it's an introduction to them to have a flavor product that is whiskey that is agave that is approachable so i look i, I can't express you know sometimes you get something i call it lightning in a bottle agave bourbon is our lightning in a bottle for sure it's super exciting because you're you're really starting to to your point touch on different demographics how has not only just the spirits and you're saying larger POs, but the the random marketing that comes with that. Are people just instantly tagging Devil's River with they're just like at a party on their Instagram and they're like, Well let's see if the social media page follows us or something? Because or, this has to be the first agave bourbon out there, right? It's the only one. That, I think mm-hmm. there's a couple of others that have come out since then. I don't think they're bourbons. I think they just call them agave whiskey. Yeah. Um but we were the first and uh, that's the other thing. I think when you have 2,700 distilleries across the U.S., you have to be unique and different in some ways, too. You know, we, we have our base bourbon, our rye, and, and barrel strength, those kind of things. But what's going to separate us from, you know, other companies out there? How can we stand out? So coming up with new and different creative ideas like agave has worked. And, and I would recommend that to any distiller that's out there. And I tell Texas distillers, come up with something unique and different. There's, you know, there was 2,200 craft distilleries back in the 1800s, and they, they, you know, they went out of business uh, sure. because of prohibition. And uh, so it's, it's taken this long for this to correct itself, and now we're we're, uh, you know, we're we're back to where we were because of these great new ideas, the changes in the laws allowing distillers to sell bottles and. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's there's been a lot of it's taken you know 100 plus years for for the government's involvement in our business to correct itself. So sure. Anyway, but but I always say new and different is the, is the best way to go if you can create something that people will enjoy. Absolutely. And I guess my my next question around the flavored products itself is in, in New York the distribution isn't necessarily as much as it is in Texas, obviously. Was your goal with these products to become a well mixer, or were your was your goal to become a um, like a whiskey product that somebody can just pick it pick up at the liquor store? Were you like were you looking to compete with them at, for well drinks and start mixing stuff at bars? Um, you know that I think the original inspiration was just to build our, this brand on what we call off premise, which is liquor stores. Mm-hmm. Um, the on premise trade, especially in places like New York City, very expensive. Um, you know, I hate to use the term pay to play, but you got to participate in, and it's expensive for a small company. And I'd rather just let the brand speak for themselves and have the consumers drive the business. And, and so I've been successful in building this brand off premise, but our spread, I'd like it to be more on premise. We're probably, you know, 80, 20, as far as where you'll find Devil's River in terms of the two. Yeah. Uh, but I've got some interesting news to report specifically on New York. Are are you guys football fans? Oh yeah, absolutely. Come on. <laughs> what what are your what are your what are your teams? Is that an obvious question? Yeah, we're the Bills. One hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't I I did some research on the Bills. I didn't realize that was named after Buffalo Bill. Do you guys know that? Yeah. yeah. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, his his burial site is right down the street from where I live in Colorado. It's where he's buried. So uh, oh, it's just interesting how it all how know. it all happened. But um well so, are you Giants fans at all? Or are you are you Jets fans at all? Or no? I mean, we don't actively hate the Giants like we actively hate the Jets because they're not in our division <laughs> okay. or conference. But also, the, yeah. <laughs> also, we have a lot of respect for Brian Dable. He's right. also a local cat. I mean, he's from the town that we're currently recording this interview in. Like, he's just okay. a really, really. He was at Queen of Heaven. Yeah, he's, like he's normal. A cool dude. He wears a polo and like khaki shorts and goes to beer tents in like the local <laughs> town that he's from still and he's the head coach of the giants like totally normal dude hopefully he's going to tell us good things about the giants and not say that they're a big <laughs> partner with the jets now we just ripped them. <laughs> I, I guess i'll leave my comments out <laughs> <laughs> why what's going on well uh, we haven't talked about it too much um but we have a new investor within our company and uh he's a jet Oh really? Oh, he's a like a physical jet. Yes, that's a power move and a half. That's massive. God, well, do I, I have mean, to start liking the Jets now? Is no, that what's happening I, here? Listen, at least you're wearing green. <laughs> you're wearing green. You covered your base. That's why. That's why I asked the question. I figured I was safe, and then I put my foot in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. we just torched them. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, that's sweet. We, we actually got introduced to Aaron Rodgers when he was at Green Bay, 
and he he's a big bourbon drinker if you guys don't know that and um and he just started talking to us and he loved the deal and and uh, so he became an investor in our company and and uh so it was pretty awesome. He's not you know? a jet. Incredible. He's been a jet for one sunrise. <laughs> yeah. He's a Green Bay Packer. He's fine. just like Brett Favre. He's yeah. a Green Bay Packer. We got a lot of respect for Aaron Rodgers. One hundred percent. Yeah, but that's, and, that's and, awesome. Know, who knows how this year is going to go? But but um, he's a he's a, I've, I've met him several times, of course, putting this deal together, and I've met him many years ago. But you know, he's a smart guy, and he's interesting, and and he's got a great sense of humor. And you know, at the end of the day. I think we all have our teams, but mm -hmm. you have to have respect for someone that's been in the league that long and, and had the stats that he's put up. And but uh, we're we're excited. You know, we need some boost in New York, and mm -hmm. we certainly need some help from Buffalo guys. So don't 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 diss us because we're not we're not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not, not that I'm not a Bills fan. I just I just don't. I'm not really any 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 fan of most most pro teams. I used to love the Houston Oilers, but they're gone. So yeah. college football guy, college football. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's everything in the South. But I will say that. We're gonna hate him two weeks out of the year, but other than that, we'll be we're Aaron Rodgers fans outside of that. So th th that's really cool that that happened. So he's just really into whiskey, and he saw that opportunity and kind of jumped on it. Yeah, and um, you know it's it's frustrating because the NFL, as we all know, stands for most play players, not for long. Mm -hmm. And so, unfortunately, the players' union will not let um, NFL players support or sponsor spirits companies. They can invest in them. But they can't publicly talk about it. We might get some, you know, some organic stuff on the Pat McAfee show or something like that. But he can't go out. We can't have cardboard cutouts of Aaron in New York liquor stores, for an example. So mm, yeah. uh, until he retires from the NFL or the 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 rules change, um, he's pretty limited to what he can do for us. But you know, he's still a big fan of the brand, and and uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this season goes. Yeah. Well, since we're not athletes, we can have cardboard cutouts of us in the liquor stores. That's, right, that's, that, a, big huh? that's, a, that's <laughs> a big point. That's a big point right Buffalo there. Buffalo area. I mean, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> I, t I just find it funny. I, I don't want to go there, but I have to go there because I have really close friends slash family that are Tennessee Titans fans. And uh, I, you mentioned the Houston Oilers. So, technically – you were a fan, and then we ruined that entire franchise by beating them so bad that they became the Tennessee Titans. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry that about the, that. That's the biggest. That's I was at that game. That's the biggest loss in NFL history. It was horrible. You know, <laughs> were you really? It, it was horrible. And and uh, of course, Bud Adams, the owner, uh, pretty pretty tough guy, tough businessman. We had the Astrodome. I mean, it was the first dome stadium in the United States. They called it the eighth wonder of the world, but it wasn't good enough. And he he wanted a new stadium. And he was probably, frankly, ahead of his time. But Houston, mm -hmm. at the time, the residents of Houston were just kind of like, no, screw that. Our money's better spent somewhere else. And he went somewhere else. So that's kind of how we lost the Oilers. But I, I did, they were a fun team to watch. Some great talent, Earl Campbell and Billy White Hughes Johnson. and Warren Moon. You know, the snake. You know, Kenny, Kenny Stabler. I mean, they had a, some pretty fun, colorful players over the years. No doubt. And they brought back the jerseys this year. So if you wanted to carve out some time, you, you're going to see the uh, the old throwbacks, which mm -hmm. is really cool that Tennessee's bringing that back. That is. That's awesome. So I had a uh, – I brought up before we recorded the first session that you released a product, and one of the old uh, – the it was the original rep that we were working with with Devil's River – she she mentioned that you were coming out with this and we were super excited because we're like okay like that's probably going to be amazing so the devil's river distiller select the single barrel was the first one that we got well right and then your distiller select was your specific tasting notes so i wanted to touch on both because the single barrel was the first single barrel that we as a company's ever received from a distillery that was personally branded to Buffalo Happy Hour. Like, it was handwritten on the label. So, that single barrel we reviewed, uh, consumed together, and actually made my wedding photo album. <laughs> so, Derek knows how much we love that single barrel and then brought it up to my wedding in Maine, because that's where I got married, to my wife, and we drank it during the wedding. And oh, that's awesome. leading that's up to awesome. the wedding as well. So when then you brought it to mine, yeah. Then I, I I reserved the rest of the bottle for his wedding. So what was really neat and interesting is the photographer knows both of us, and he's like, "Okay, you guys are like real big whiskey deal guys. So like, what what do you want to do?" And I was like, "All right." In the getting ready photos, 
this is what I'm drinking. So I'm surrounded by my groomsmen and my dad, and I'm always having it neat, and then they're all making fun of me. They're like, you're an absolute machine. Like, I don't understand how your stomach can do that. Like, we haven't ate in, like, seven hours. I'm like, screw food. Like, this is, I need my brown water. I'm good. So I'm drinking that, and the photographer is eating it up because it's in a nice glass. Um, he put it next to like my shoes and my watch and it's literally like a showcase photo inside of my wedding album. Um, and then with Derek, I brought it back out and he goes, Oh my God, you save some. I said, well, yeah. So we're in the limo for his wedding and we're finishing it. So do you want to touch on that single barrel and the work that went into it? Because it was unbelievable. Well, thank you. Yeah. That again, all Texas grown, uh, grain, um, from the Texas panhandle. It's number one yellow dent corn, and it's called a Brissetto rye, which is, you know, rye doesn't grow very good down in Texas because it is so hot, but Brissetto rye actually grows quite well. And then the barley is grown and malted in Texas, so it is 100% Texas mash bill. Um, you know, these single barrels, I think we did originally, you've got one of a very few. I think we did maybe 100 single barrels for the whole country. And so I'm talking a barrel of whiskey would mm -hmm. maybe produce 27 to 33 cases we touched earlier on the angel share. Mm -hmm. So it depends on where in the floor of the rick house the barrel is. So the higher ones obviously have a higher angel share. But, you know, these are chosen for their just exceptional flavor. And so what we do now is we go around, we've got a briefcase full of four or five different single barrels, and we'll meet with a customer like, you know, say Benny's in Chicago, and we'll let them try the single barrel, the five samples, and they choose the one they want. And then we hand label each one of them and it takes about two months, three months for them to get it. It comes with the barrel on the 27 to 33 cases and it gets put on a pallet and shipped up there. So that's kind of how the single barrels work. But we've had individuals buy complete single barrels, quite a few individuals and of course a lot of liquor companies. Mm -hmm. A lot of bourbon clubs have bought our single barrels. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, it was, it was so good and it was so hot at 128 proof and it's just delicious all in all. You said that the rye is very difficult to grow. Kind of going back to that five-year that you're coming out with, is that all that same rye, or are you sourcing rye from other areas? It's the same rye. It's the Brissetto rye, um, and it's the same mash bill as our regular rye whiskey. Uh, it's the 51%, so it just barely qualifies <laughs> as a rye. Um, but I tried some for the first time in, in a while last week. It is coming along so nice. I can't wait to get it in a bottle. It is so wonderful. I mean, I'm really proud of this product, and and the the price point is 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 a little bit more, but it's it's worth it. I mean, it's 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 an allocated item that we're not going to have very many of. Mm -hmm. I think we're doing 1,200 cases is all we're doing of that product. So it's probably mainly going to be in Texas. We'll figure out a way sure. to get you guys a bottle, but uh, oh, it's it's really that. turning out fantastic. So uh, I'm sorry, did you say it was 51 percent rye, or that's the other rye that you have? It, they're both 51 okay. percent rye. Gotcha. That's, yeah, that's and we're awesome. using a number three char, um, which okay. is another unique difference um, on the on those products. Mm -hmm. uh, the Distiller Select, um, it's the standard Devil's River mash bill of the 75 corn, 21 rye, 4% malted barley. Um, and, just, you know, different char, different uh, age cycle. And, and uh, those are, I think it was 80 barrels that were blended together um, for chosen for their just exceptional. The Distiller Select, in general, is my favorite. Um, but the single barrels, some of them were so awesome. I mean, uh, there's some that are just impossible to find, but if you can find a bottle of it, it's get it because they're really hard to get and they're really well reviewed and well received by most bourbon connoisseurs. Oh yeah. That's what I'm drinking right now. I can't get enough of it when you're, <laughs> so with all of them being the same mash bill though, when you're going through the Rick house to understand like which ones you want to blend in for the base small batch. Are you just tasting a barrel and saying, oh, no, no, this is way too good. I have to have this for either the distiller select or single barrel. Is that the process? That's exactly how it happens. You know, oh. you come across an exceptional barrel, you say, hold this guy out. You know, it's just, it's too good. You know, distillate, you know, distillation is amazing to me. The process of aging whiskey is amazing to me. It's very simple. I mean, it's three simple ingredients, water, grain, and yeast. That's mm -hmm. it. Uh, by law, we can't, you know, unless we're doing flavors, if you're just doing bourbon, that, that's all you can use. So the factors that affect that, you know, you can have the same mash bill with the same yeast strain distilled on the same day, put in the barrel on this, you know, the same day, 
and sitting there side by side after two or three years and they're completely different and it's the barrel you know the barrel is responsible for 100 percent of the color and 60 percent of the flavor so the barrel plays a very key role it's like a fingerprint and uh i love that about you know the, the uniqueness that each barrel brings to the the same you know white dog sure now where do you source your barrels uh, we use independent stave out of kentucky okay and we order them mid-tree which um you can order you know specifically order barrels a certain way um so the middle of the tree um and that's just a request that you put in and they they oblige and barrels have gone up uh again one of the reasons we had to raise our prices because the the barrel the price of barrels and there's been a barrel shortage for quite some time sure. so um, that's not the only thing that's gone up. It's grain, it's bottles, it's it's packaging, it's labor, and it's, it's everything. So we we held on as long as we could, but we had to take a price increase in January. So, yeah. Your your standard bottle shape. What's what was the decision behind that? Well, Op- opposed you know, to I mean, like the what what do they call it, the Arizona bottle or yeah Arizona. Yeah, it's like a flask. You know, it's it's a Texas kind of old west feel and look and. Um, those are made for us by Pavisa down in Mexico. Um, that's the same company that makes the bottle for um, Patron tequila. Mm. And uh, but uh, some and some other news to to present. We are actually changing our bottle. Oh. Um, the bottle that's the distiller the select in a single barrel. Every, the entire family is going to be in a bottle similar to those. I don't know how you guys feel about that. If you like that packaging better than the other bottle. The problem that we have is a lot of, because that bottle is so wide, it takes a lot of shelf space up in retail stores, and people turn it sideways, and we don't like that. So, we, so we're going to that, that other bottle that's a little bit narrower, and that'll hit the shelves probably in January or February of next year. Yeah, that's what, I mean, when you asked if what we thought about it, that's exactly what I was going to say, because one of our sponsors is a liquor store, and we understand how pivotal shelf space is. Yeah. And understanding the fact that this bottle is significantly <laughs> thinner than the regular distiller's select bottle or the single barrel bottle it just makes more sense i do love the fact that this is a flask that was one of the things that we pointed out when we did review the product because it's just very unique but shelf space is the most important and to get something that fits on a shelf and that liquor stores want to bring in on the shelf because it doesn't take the space of two bottles matters so much more than aesthetics at that point and it's not like that bottle looks bad it looks great it's just different yeah yeah it's um you know, it's it's kind of bittersweet for me. We surveyed our customers and asked their opinion, and I think 66% voted for the new bottle. So that's not 100. It's not 90, but it's more than the the average. So sure. majority wins. <laughs> so we're going to go with it. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I'm always interested on, because we talk a lot about Kentucky and how the Kentucky bourbon, like people get very – I want Kentucky, and it's the whole barometric pressure that we talked about earlier, everything going in and out of the barrel. Um, New York decided that we wanted to create our own brand of Empire Rye, so that's an actual classification of whiskey. Do you ever see Texas making its actual own classification of whiskey because of how distinct it is from the rest of the country? There's been a big push for that among several of my, you know, other distilleries in Texas. Um it kind of backed off on it recently and I, you know, I'd be in support of it if they decided they wanted to bring it back. But we do have the Texas whiskey trail, uh, and the Texas whiskey association and they have a certification process. It's a completely separate organization. Um, but they're focused just on Texas whiskey. So, you know, we, we, again, we're a distance behind Kentucky and Tennessee in, 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 and so we, are trying you know we're making that effort to have our own trail now we're on the trail we're one of the distilleries that's on the trail trail members can come by and and get the access to certain discounts in our gift shop and they can get uh, access to certain samples that other consumers wouldn't be able to get and so you know there is a benefit of that membership for advocates of texas whiskey um but you know we i mean i think i was at buffalo trace recently and they had i think they had five hundred thousand tourists last year Mm. i mean (laughs) I, so we don't come close to those numbers. We might do, uh, you know, 300 a, a, a weekend or 400 a weekend, which is a good number, but mm-hmm. it's not a half a million. <laughs> right, yeah. I, yeah, that's, yeah, that's insane. That's crazy. Because, I mean, it, that it, it, just goes to the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Everybody wants to go. But if we establish the Texas Distilleries Trail, then people will want to go there. Like, the, how many How many are on that trail? Um, I think that there's 15, 15. now. Oh, wow. That's pretty good. So it's it's uh, it's grown, and... and uh, 
you know, they're they're kind of centrally located around themselves as a big concentration up around Fredericksburg, High, Dripping Springs area, Central Texas mm-hmm. mainly. Uh, we're probably one of the furthest ones south. Yeah. I don't think people realize how big Texas is, though. I mean, they really yeah. don't. It's insane. Yeah, I mean, it, I was reading the other day from, from the Louisiana border to El Paso is 900 miles. I mean, it's... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, that's crazy. It's ridiculous. It's it's just, it's just, I love how he's just sitting there chuckling. He's like, yeah. "Hell yeah, that's insane! <laughs> Everything's bigger it's, than Texas." God. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. We have thirty million people here now. The tech, the state's really grown, and and uh, a lot of California people coming in from different parts of the United States. And I think it has a lot to do with our state laws and our economy, and and uh, and so. Uh, but it's still, you know, it's hot. I, that's mm-hmm. why I have a house in Colorado to get away from this sometimes because it's just so freaking hot sometimes. Sure. Yeah, I don't blame you. So people hear us talk about all the time how great Devil's River is. But before we round out this episode, w- what is your pitch? Like, what is Devil's River's pitch to get people to try the products? Like, w- what are what are you guys known for outside of us just talking about the products? What do you normally tell people? Well, I, I mean, first of all, if you're a fan of of good quality bourbon that's that's handcrafted um and you don't want the distraction of too much um methyl alcohol too much alcohol distraction you know too much burn um we'll offer that a devil's river offers that because we have two proprietary finishing processes that we do that don't take away flavor but they knock away some of the harshness you were talking about the single barrel being 120 plus proof people are amazed that that's 120 proof sometimes they check it and make sure <laughs> but we we are we are what we say we are um but it's got a lot of flavor and less of a distraction of, of you know some of that heat that heat's good don't mm-hmm. get me wrong but I, I think it can be a distraction if it's not managed so i think it's an approachable uh, i hate to use the word smooth but you know it's a good word uh, uh approachable whiskey that's affordable we try to try to keep our prices if you're interested in, in expanding into the Texas whiskey portfolio, look for us and give us a shot, and hopefully you like it. I love that. Mike, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. One more time, where can people find um, Devil's River and the announcement of that five-year coming out? Can you just kind of round out the episode with talking about that five-year again? Sure. Um, so our newest expression that we'll be releasing this fall is the Devil's River Five-Year Rye River Series. Um, which a portion of the Sail Beach bottle is going to support AmericanRivers.org um, to help with nationally with any wild river across the U.S. It's managed by them, which is a lot most of them. Um, so we're glad to be part of that. Um, we're in 34 states. Uh, if we're not in your state, you, you can continue to request, and we'll we'll try to get to your state as soon as we can. We are the exclusive rye whiskey of Norwegian Cruise Lines. Uh, that just recently happened. That was pretty exciting for us. Um, we got to we knocked out Bullet Rye, so that's a pretty <laughs> nice. big deal. Oh yeah! And uh, we're also on Carnival Cruise Lines, and we're on um, Celebrity Cruise Lines. We're in over 200 military bases around the world, and we're in five other countries besides the U.S. But we're we'll hopefully be at a liquor store near you. It's a long process, as you guys know, to get distribution, mm-hmm. but uh, we're working on it every day. Appreciate your time so much. Everybody, if you're looking for a good whiskey, you'll hear Mike and I say this for the next 14 years because we can't suggest Devil's River enough. You have to at least go try them. It's so affordable, too, at $34 for the, and even less than 50 You just have to try it because it is the smoothest. I know we're going to say that word, but the smoothest, most well-rounded, sweet but perfect burn whiskey that you can get for under 50 bucks. It blows everything out of the water. So you just have to go try it. Try it for yourself. Try to find a local bar that has it before you buy it if you're really that person. But just just try the product, and it'll speak for itself, and try to get in a liquor store around you. Mike, anything else? Mike, thank you so much no, for your guys, time, sir. I really appreciate your time. Great to meet you in person, and, and uh, uh, appreciate your interest in Devil's River. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Go check them out, Devil's River, on social media, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye.